listening to the accounts of survivors and people of Oteng, having read the report of the Director General of Police and the Home Commissioner of the Government of Nagaland, and after visiting the spot, the killing site, as a member, as part of a six-member FNR team to Oteng, where 13 innocent civilians were killed. All this information indicates that there was utter disregard for the right to life and personal liberty. It was a blatant display of force and unjustifiable abuse of power. Madam Chairperson, respected leaders and members of the public, what happened on December 4th constitutes the gravest assault of human dignity and life. Without the right to life, all other rights cannot be secured. The TZ police station filed a Suomoto FIR against the 21st Para Special Forces of the Indian Army, where it stated, and I quote, security forces blankly fired at a vehicle without provocation, without any provocation, resulting in the killing of many Oting villagers and seriously injuring many others, unquote. And of course, the FIR went on to add, hence, it's obvious that the intention of security forces was to murder and injure civilians, unquote. While all of us are awaiting the government of Nagaland's special investigation team to complete their investigation and make, their, and make public their findings, the corridors of power, the corridors of authority, and the powers that be are spinning their own narratives on the sequence of events. In other words, there seems to be a clash of truths. The people, we the people, are seeking the truth based on facts, a truth that brings facts to light. Whereas for the powers that be, their truth is to obscure and mask the ugly reality, covering the facts so that they are never bought to light, the clash of truths. This underscores why the stories from Oting and Mon need to be told and need to be heard. Today's public lamentation is part of that process. The stories of Oting need to be told so that no matter what the powers that be try to change the narratives, the lived experiences and accounts of the survivors become our living memories. The Oting killing is sustained by a culture of impunity that originates from the Armed Forces Special Powers Act. Derived from the 1942 Armed Forces Special Powers Ordinance, which was introduced by the British to suppress the Quit India Movement, the Armed Forces Special Powers Act was introduced in 1958 in response to the Naga political movement. In its 63 years, the Armed Forces Special Powers Act has not achieved its purpose. And in our Naga experience, the ASPA is not only a colonial legislation, but it is also anti-peace. Not only has Armed Forces Special Powers Act weakened India's democratic framework, but it has proven to be counterintuitive, counterintuitive to human values and the sacredness of human life. In 1982, the Naga People's Movement for Human Rights filed a petition in the Supreme Court challenging the constitutional validity 
of the Armed Forces Special Powers Act. After 15 long years, in August 1997, the case was finally argued. At that time, I was a student of law and also a human rights activist. And so the, the court had appointed Kapil Sibyl, and perhaps many of you are, would be familiar with his name. Kapil Sibyl was appointed as the amicus curie to represent the NPMHR. And there was a host of other lawyers, senior uh, lawyers and advocates, like Inda J. Singh, uh, Ravindra Bhatt, uh, Shanti Bhushan, and others who, during the course of the two weeks, the hearing was for two weeks, and every day I attended the sessions in the Supreme Court for two weeks. But here's my observation. Because when the case was being argued, you know, if you remember at that time, this was 1997, and so in 1994, we had the Mokchong incident in December 27th. Then we had the Akuloto incident in January 23rd, 1995, followed by the Koema incident, March 5th, 1995. All these reports, because if you recall, the government of, India, uh, the government of Nagaland had constituted a one-man inquiry a commission led by Justice Sen, Sen. So all his, the reports along with a fact-finding report called Where Peacekeepers Have Declared War. All these were also submitted as part of the hearing. But my observation was that most of the arguments were centered on principles and concepts and not how the ASPA was impacting people on a daily basis. So the arguments were mostly on concepts and principles, but not really on things that, would, that happened in Oting, or things that happened in Koema, or in Akuloto, or in Oinam, and so on and so forth. You can name many names, but it was centered on concepts. And so the PUDR, is the People's Union for Democratic Rights. In its critique, stated that the court refused to go into the actual working of the act and deemed it irrelevant for purposes of deciding its constitu constitutionality. And its proceedings were on abstract constitutional principles divorced from life. And so eventually, in November 1997, the Supreme Court upheld the constitutional validity of the Armed Forces Special Powers Act. It's tragic because it failed to realize that repealing the ASPA will not weaken, will not weaken. Rather, it will only strengthen India's constitutional democracy. It failed to realize that. Today, this evening, we are gathered to lament the Oking Massacre. And while we recognize that ASPA is only a symptom, is only a symptom of a deeper political question, Oting reminds us that the Armed Forces Special Powers Act has no place. It has no place in our contemporary world of the 21st century, and it must be repealed. However, it will require strong moral and political leadership and an unrelenting strategic nonviolent people's movement to ensure that there are no more incidents like voting. Respected leaders, nations, governments, and states are judged not by their ability and capacity to make war. Rather, they are judged by their willingness and ability to make peace. Governments, states, and people are not judged on their ability to make war. They are judged on their capacity and willingness and their ability to make peace. This is what makes them distinct. The Oting killings have made me pause to think, and it begs the question whether India's sincerity Willingness, ability, and approach is the road to making long-term peace. That's the question I ask myself. 
is just a road to peace. And so it's very important for the world to know that Nagas want long-term peace. I'm sure all of us here, we just heard Tae's point. We all want peace. Not short-term peace. We want long-term peace. But Nagas don't want peace that is imposed from above. But we want an inclusive peace that emerges from the ground up based on justice, which recognizes our rights to chart our own destiny. We want a peace that is just and dignified. The tragedies for me in Oting and Mon have occurred at a time when Nagas are encircled in darkness. And why do I say that? We have become blind with suspicion, selfishness, division, distrust, corruption, and so on. Our values are degenerating as we are forgetting our history and who we are as a people. Today, we are taught how not to be a Naga, and we are turning into something that we are not. Our leadership is fragmented, and the perils of isms obstruct our part from moving forward. And so I say that we are encircled in darkness. In the aftermath of the Oting killings, Wallonier sent a message saying that the civilians were killed without a cause, but created a cause in their debt. Perhaps they are reminding us of our history. Perhaps they are reminding us of who we are as a people. And therefore, I ask myself, I ask myself, what does Oting mean to me? What does Oting mean to me? And I encourage you to ask yourself the same. What does Oting mean to you? I feel it's time for Nagas to awaken and reach out to one another, to stand in solidarity, to humble ourselves, and to learn to be united in purpose. While traveling to Oting from Tizit, and those of you perhaps who have traveled to Oting would know that the road is quite steep, steep and you know the condition of the roads in, in Nagaland. So while going from Tizit to Oting on December 10th, and it was, it's and now I think more than ever, it is essential for us to extend our solidarity with the Konyaks. And so I want to hear end with a poem by Liam McAlston entitled, We Saw a Vision. In the darkness of despair, we, we saw a vision. We lit the light of hope, and it was not extinguished. In the desert of discouragement, we saw a vision. We planted the tree of valor, and it blossomed. In the winter of bondage, we saw a vision. We melted the snow, the snow of lethargy, and the river of resurrection flowed with it, flowed from it. We sent our vision a swim, like a swan on the river. The vision became a reality. Winter became summer. Bondage became freedom. And this we left to you as our inheritance. O oh, generation of freedom, remember us, the generation of vision. Thank you. <laughs>